hello and welcome to the Art of Engineering podcast. I'm your host, Chad Hardin, a structural engineer in Irvine and chair of ASC Orange County Branch Structural Engineering Institute. You can find us online at www.taepodcast.com. And once again, this show explores the evolution of a career in engineering and also promotes engineering outreach and STEM and STEAM in schools. The show is also an exploration of the idea that artistic and engineering processes are important as an artistic creation in and of themselves. And today we have a special interview with Professor Maria Garlock, Associate Professor at Princeton, Princeton University. I was first introduced to Professor Garlock's work through the fascinating online course, The Art of Structural Engineering Bridges through EDX. Well, thank you again, Professor Garlock, for your time today. Uh, welcome. and uh, Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to say I really enjoyed the, I actually took the course, The Art of Structural Engineering Bridges, and it was really fascinating. Um, I think there's something for everybody in there, uh, from uh, maybe beginning engineers getting an idea of the, of the mechanics of engineering, to the history of bridges and how they've been designed, to uh, some of the t- uh, controlling variables such as available materials, to uh, and what I thought was the most fascinating was the the tenets of structural art and it's something I hadn't ever seen before and again it's just really a fascinating course and I thought um, what any any now that you've gone through the course and, and taught it what are any thoughts that you have on on that well I'm I'm glad that you enjoyed that the course was uh, based on the scholarship of David Billington a uh, professor emeritus here from Princeton University and um, and I'm, a, I guess, a big fan and believer in what he's teaching, this idea of structural engineering and pure engineering being a form of art that's different from the art of architecture. Right. And um, I really enjoyed putting together that online course and uh, sharing that idea with the rest of the world. Now, will you, um, I'll put a link to the course for, for listeners. Uh, it's uh, through EDX. It's www edx.org and then there's a longer uh, link to the uh, to the actual course um, that I'll put on on the website Um, but will you be giving the course again yes actually we will probably launch that same course on bridges uh, next winter probably around February and followed by another version of the same course focusing on vaults long span roof structures and then a third version of it based on buildings so we're planning uh, to relaunch the same one once again, plus two new ones to follow. Okay. Oh, that sounds very fascinating. And you have a really interesting background. I was reading through your CV, performance of, of uh, I think, welded connections or moment frame connections to fire, performance of fire um, in buildings to a lot of the, the, the history of art, both for buildings and bridges. I wonder, how did you... Um, How did you get into so many different interesting areas? (laughs) Right. Well, at the core of everything is structural engineering. So I I just love structural engineering as a whole, being bridges or buildings and how to engineer them, how to design them. And um, this fascination started when I was very young, probably on the order of, I don't know, 10 years old. Okay. So uh, I grew up near the New York City area. So... I was often seeing and crossing over these long span bridges like the Verrazano Narrows, which is the structure that I call the inspiration for me to become a structural engineer. I was fascinated with the Verrazano. And then entering Manhattan, um, the original Twin Towers, for example, and I would stand at the corner of these towers and look up and wonder, how do you build something so tall and just so straight? So it was the curiosity of how do you build such a long span bridge? How do you build such a tall building? And being really curious about them that um, I think led me to this career in structural engineering. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I have to say, um, back to the course, um, there's really such a great history on on those the aesthetics um, of of the bridges. And one of my favorites was um, your discussion on, well, first, the first week, the origins of structural art, and you go into what you what you said was the tenets of structural art, both, uh, I think, the, the efficiency, economy, and elegance, and then the measures, which is more on the, the scientific side to also the artistic side. How do you measure art? Um, I thought that was really fascinating. And then uh, week yeah. five, I think my favorite one was Robert Maillard and the Concrete Bridges. Um, 
there's a really good quote that you put in there from from David Billington and uh, his work. It, it seemed like the first time uh, and the quote is he confronted the art world for the first time with a body of 20th century work that is acknowledged to be art, but that came completely from the imagination of the engineer. And I thought that was so fascinating. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's at the core of this art, where the art comes from the imagination of the engineer. It's an art that's disciplined by uh, the technical training that we have, but we understand that within this technical training, we stay inside the boundaries, but the boundaries are, are far apart. So there's a lot of room to play inside of these boundaries and find that art, art form and iterate the design until you design something that that is aesthetic so that's what I was referring to in the lectures as discipline and play so the structural artist is disciplined by these technical training by the fundamentals of statics and mechanics and equilibrium but there's a whole lot of room to play inside of those boundaries to create the art form okay something I've been struggling with is um that that process that artistic process and um, the engineering process as we as we go through and, and design something at some point the design almost becomes a language where you're so familiar with the idea in your head about what you're doing and then yeah. you put that those thoughts into paper on you know for the calculations that we have to combine for designing a bridge or a building and sometimes the the sketching of the of of what we're doing is, or the abstract thoughts that we're trying to to uh, that are going on inside our head as we're doing the design, it really creates kind of an an eloquent sketch. And how does that can that be defined as as art? The process of engineering, or either the process or the the, the de, not the deliverable, which would be the plans, but rather the calculations themselves or or the sketches that we do, can that be defined as a, as an artistic process? I want to make sure I understand your question. Are you asking if the process itself is artistic? Is that what you you mean yeah, by it, your question? Is there an art form or like a? I'm, I've been trying to, I've been searching this for a little while, and, and um, it's a harder. I'm hard. It's probably hard to define the question, <laughs> but okay. But so so we do a sketch based on our engineering calcs, and sometimes the design it, it feels like an artistic process. It's not just crunching numbers, because we have some creativity and it's some expression of ourselves. Um, right. Is is there any um, area of art that that falls into that maybe so others this, might be doing the same thing? I don't know, or, or studying the same idea. So this uh th this idea of discipline and play okay. that I uh, that I mentioned falls into this uh, category of the process of design. So the the process of design is an iterative process which is the process of calculations and using the appropriate equations to find the forms to make the structural form as efficient as possible. But there's so much room to play inside of that. And right. that's where the, the iteration comes in and the play comes in. And the idea that there's not one solution, just one solution, I should say, right. to an engineering problem um, opens this, this idea to to engineering being a work of art because you have so many options so find the the one that fits best or the one that's that's aesthetic and that's pleasing but can right. still be um uh but but it's still efficient and economical so there's a, there's another quote by a famous engineer um eduardo toroja that i didn't cover in the MOOC on bridges because he he's um, going to come in when I talk about the vaulted structures. Okay. So he's a Spanish engineer, very famous in Spain, and uh, related to uh, what the question was related to is this process art. He asks, you know, is this process? I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the question he's asking himself, but he's asking himself essentially, is this process of design, these iterations of design, is it an imaginative process? Or is it, quote, he says, logical reasoning based on technical training? And he answers the question that he asks himself, and he says, quote, it's both together. So meaning it's both an imaginative process and logical reasoning based on technical training. And he says, continuing the quote, the imagination alone could not have reached such a design unaided by reason. 
To me, it seems clear that the imagination can operate successfully only in conjunction with the basic principles of technical creative work. So, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is, again comes back to the idea of the process of design and this evolution of design is an art because if the, if the intent is, again, efficiency, economy, and elegance. Right. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. So um, have you thought of pulling, I mean, I'm sure you have, but are pulling all the um, kind of the, the tenets of structural art and then some of the history of how that developed or those concepts developed into a book of some kind? This idea that is in the MOOC, this idea of structural art, is already in a book by okay. David Billington. Um, the book is... Um, uh, the Tower and the Bridge. So it's a it's a pretty popular book. I mentioned it, I think, in the beginning of the MOOC, and um, there are some colleagues who are talking about creating a volume two or part two. He wrote that book in nineteen mid in nineteen eighties, maybe eighty five, eighty four. And so since then, there have been new designs and new engineers that are uh, perhaps worth mentioning. So there are discussions going on about another volume of that book or or part two of that book but nothing yet in progress or in print. I'm wondering the way you presented the development of where bridge design and construction started to today, it really took some leaps. And the one of my favorite parts in your in your course was the, the evolution of the bridge masters, where it was the three steps was imitation, innovation, and then inspiration. And I thought yeah, that was so. really an eloquent summary. First, you have to imitate to to just understand what you're doing right we all start there and right. then the best you know the best of the best then they they innovate on those designs and do something interesting and then they do something and you know they have an inspiration to do something completely different and it seems like that was the major st- stepping yeah. stones to go from stone bridges to you know to iron and then to you know pre-stressed concrete and long span bridges do you think it's possible today to see to see similar innovation from where we are now Yes, I think today there is uh, definitely an opportunity for innovation. Um, for example, we can innovate with new materials uh, and maybe even new forms. But um, in general, generally speaking, our profession is very conservative, mm. and maybe it's gotten more conservative as the decades have gone on, where uh, it's a challenge to introduce new concepts and new materials, and we have to make sure we have standards and rules for them. So it's possible. It's just, uh, I think, in today's world, maybe, I'm not sure if, if this is correct, but maybe a little bit more challenging than it was 50 years ago or right. 100 years ago. Interesting. Um, yeah, I think today it seems like recently the few of the trends have been, um, at least in the bridge world, accelerated bridge construction using precast methods. So maybe different, mate- yeah. maybe different uh, construction methods. Different construction methods or different structural systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of research out there for earthquake engineering and, and new structural systems for earthquake engineering. Right. My, my work on fire engineering as well. Um, new innovative ways to design structures for fire. So there's a lot of research out there, innovative research. Uh, but to move that research into practice takes a lot of time. Right, right. So what are, what are, what are, what's your next uh, big research project? My next big research project, uh, I will probably continue my work on on structure fire uh, interaction. I'm looking at um, the stability of plates. So again, sticking to the the uh, structural engineering world. Again, sticking mm. to my passion and what I love the most, and and working and talking with practicing engineers who um, are really at the frontier. They are the ones that are. Uh, the ones designing, so keeping my uh, my one foot on that ground to hear what's going on and hear what the needs are is important for everything I do. So yeah, um, that's a good point. You you actually got your um, your undergrad and then your master's and then you worked um, in practice for some time and then you went back to uh, get your doctorate and then you've done all these wonderful things. Can you talk about the the differences between your your um, experience in practice as well as in academia? Yes, I could talk about my experiences. Um, and this career path that I took wasn't something I had planned. So as I said, when I was 10 or 12, I wanted to be an engineer and I wanted to design something either super long or super tall. And so my uh, the universities I attended uh, and going for a master's degree was part of that plan. So after the master's degree, 
I worked for Leslie Robertson in New York City where I had the chance to design some really tall structures and, and some that weren't tall but were complex. So mm-hmm. it, was, it was a challenging um, work environment, which was wonderful. I really am grateful for the, those years that I had practicing and actually designing structures, structures that were built. So it was really a wonderful experience. Uh, while I was there being a designer, I still had in my mind the experience of a master's student where I had the opportunity to do research, um, something that was required for this master's degree, but nothing that, again, I expected to like so much. And I also had a little bit of teaching experience as a as a master's student. Again, something I didn't expect to like so much. So mm-hmm. while I was practicing... Um, even though I, I, I absolutely enjoyed that experience, I had the sense that for the long-term career path, I might enjoy research and teaching more than actual actually designing. And so I left practice to obtain the PhD because in academia, you need that PhD to get hired. You can't get hired without it. Right. So I went, uh, I obtained the PhD and then I came right from the PhD to Princeton University. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I did, I did a little bit of, um, uh, I mean, in, in uh, getting my master's, I, I had to be a, a teaching assistant, and uh, I found you really have to you really have to understand something if you're going to teach it, right? Absolutely, the best way I say that the best way to learn something is to teach it, right? Because as soon as you step in front of that class, you are the expert in whatever you're teaching, right? And the students are expecting you to be that expert, so you have to know everything and anticipate the questions they're going to ask, and the students are very bright and sharp, so you won't get away with it if you don't know it they'll figure that out so you really need to know (laughs) what you're teaching before you get in front of that class yes but it's fun I really enjoy it and and maybe going back to the to the original question of what's the difference or the experience between practice and and university it is very very different Um, in practice at least because I was a young engineer and never moved up I was never long enough to move up in the ranks to become partner or anything like that I didn't have to worry about going out and getting the jobs. My job was to, the jobs that the partners were being in, I would be designing along with the partner, whatever came in. And um, it was a, you know, kind of a nine to five job. A lot of times more hours than that, depending on the, you know, when something was due, we worked more hours. It depended, right? But it was pretty uh, rigid, you know, Monday through Friday, the weekends you go home. In academia, it's much more fluid. I, don't f- I feel like I'm never done. <laughs> so right. <laughs> I'm always doing re- there's a, it, research. Research is infinite, and there's never a time where I could say, okay, I'm done doing research. It's infinite. So you put in the hours that you need, and those hours are often you know long hours to do both the research and the teaching. But I would say that the people who do this really love what they're doing, and that's the key. You have to love what you're doing. Right. And um, and I love, like I said, the research, and I love the teaching and the interaction with the students, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. So um, in hindsight, it was the right decision for me. Oh, good. What's your inspiration for coming up with research ideas or, or teaching ideas with the course? Uh, I, I don't know how to say what my inspiration is for teaching or research ideas because I do actually find I, I'm in a, I'm trying to innovate both at research and at teaching mm-hmm. and um, not only in the way that I teach but even in the subjects that I teach um, but in both cases it it just comes to me I don't really know what the the mechanism is for the ideas to develop maybe it's just enough years of teaching now that I understand better the student and how the student learns. Um, maybe it's what, like I said, the, the interaction with a practicing engineer and I'm married to one, so that helps. Oh, so okay. my, husband, <laughs> my husband is a practicing structural engineer working in the same company that I worked at, Leslie Robertson. So, um, so that helps to keep my ear, you know, where it oh, needs yeah. to be. So maybe it's a little bit of everything, but I, I can't point to one single right. thing. Oh, that's fascinating. That's really good, mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um, if you had to pick your favorite structure, then what what would you say between any, anything, buildings or bridges? I would probably pick my first love, which would be the Verrazano Narrows right. Bridge. Yes. I mean, they, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with all, all of them, 
obviously, but if I had to pick one, it would probably be that because it was, as I said, my first love. Right. And, and then, um, a question I like to, to ask everybody is, uh, what, what, um, aspects of your work require the most creativity or the least? All of my work requires creativity. I, don't, I, I can't say one or the other. Like I was saying earlier, the the teaching requires creativity. I now evolved to the... Initially, I would teach in a very static, traditional way. And it took many years, maybe almost 10 years, for me to feel comfortable enough in front of an audience to try new things and try new ideas. And so now that I have that confidence, I'm exploring new things and being creative in how I teach. And um, the material is the same, but how I deliver it is, I would say, creative in in many ways. And um, then I started reading the literature about the teaching, and it turns out there's research behind these methods that I had been trying, and the, these this research is showing that these methods are very effective. Okay. So, um, so there's definitely creativity in, in the teaching. And also in the research. So for me, the research that I do, I like to move to different places of research. Uh, I like to find new pockets of research that's needed. And I think that's the biggest challenge for a researcher is to find what are the research needs. And that takes sometimes creative thinking and um, redefining oneself sometimes. So and Mm. I find that also very exciting. Can you talk more when you say redefining yourself? how, do, how does that relate to, to what you're doing? So redefining myself in terms of research means trying a new research area that maybe you're not expert at yet. When I came to Princeton, I, um, my, my expertise was in earthquake engineering. My PhD was structured around earthquake engineering of steel buildings. And when I came to arrived at Princeton, I wanted to continue this work, but I also wanted to find my a path that was mine and not just mine and my advisors from my phd study so that took a little bit of reinventing and studying and learning something on my own and that was the fire engineering that uh that i do now okay uh so that's what i mean by reinventing i came here in 2002 it was right after 9 11 and it was very clear that we didn't understand well how structures respond in a fire scenario, massive fire scenarios, and I wanted to contribute to that knowledge. So I learned uh, this material. And uh, so that that kind of evolution of learning new topics uh, and not being afraid to learn something new. Right. That's 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 very uh, very interesting. I think it, it's probably very um, sometimes scary or, or and also obviously challenging when you reinvent yourself a little bit. It is. It's challenging, but it's exciting, and that, and that's what I love about academia. It gives you the freedom to do that, to say I don't have to stick to this one single topic, one single path, but I have the opportunity to find where is it that I can make the biggest contribution to my profession Mm -hmm. and um, to see what it is and to take that leap of faith to say, okay, I'm going to study this, I'm going to figure this out, and I'm going to work in this area, even though I don't have yet the expertise I need to move forward in it. Right. And it seems like academia is a way, uh, an area where you you can really um, devote yourself to improving improving um, the industry or community in, in really aggressive ways, like, um, you know, having the passion to, to improve fire safety. You know, you can really just dive in, and that might be harder in practice. That's right. Yes, it's a great place for that. In practice, sometimes there's companies that encourage research, but most of the time, financially, it's hard for a company to devote a lot of their um, employee hours to do this kind of research. Right. Uh, when you when you want to relax and get away from research, is there a is there a, a type of art or um, favorite work of art you enjoy in your in your life? I don't know that I'd call myself an artist, uh-huh. <laughs> so I can recognize art in structures when I see it, and I can recognize art when I see it. But I don't know if I'd call myself an artist. And um, what I do to relax? Well, when I'm not working, I, I have a. Uh, four kids at home, so oh, okay. I like to spend time with my children and my husband, and and just relax with them. In the summer, it's going to the beach or the pool, and right. I, I don't know, just 
stepping away from work and focusing 100% on my family is what I like to do. Right, right. Well, I have um, just a few more uh, questions. These are from some um, a fourth grade class, and I, I guess they're kind of surprise questions, probably. Um, uh, you want to, uh, and, and then we can we can actually split them up a little bit, um, depending because I know you haven't seen these before, um, and it's from, so it's from a fourth grade class. Uh, on, and some of the questions are related to bridge engineering, and the question was just any question related to science, technology, engineering, art, or math, which is STEAM. <laughs> okay so um some of the questions are kind of funny but uh they're, they're cute uh so this is interesting how is it i think this is how is it that small bridges are strong and bigger bridges are weak i don't think that's true i wouldn't say that small bridges are strong and big bridges are weak they're all strong they're all strong enough to carry the loads that they need to carry the loads being um, the the vehicles or the people or the wind or the earthquake they're all designed to be strong enough and actually stronger than they need to be because we need that safety factor right. to carry those uh, loads imposed by again the people or or nature. Um, uh, this is a good question. What is do you know you you probably know this? What is the biggest what is the biggest bridge? Or maybe the longest, I guess. <laughs> okay. What is the longest bridge? Uh, the last I heard, and, and maybe I'm outdated in my knowledge, it's the uh, the one in Japan, the, the Akashi oh, okay. um, bridge in Japan. So that's the, at least the last I heard, no one's exceeded that span. Let's see. Oh, this is a great question. When you build a bridge, do you mostly use division? <laughs> There's a lot of division when we uh, design and build bridges, a lot of it, yes, and multiplication and addition and uh, quite a bit more math. Right. But yes, yes, you need to know math. <laughs> this is an interesting question. When you are building your bridge, what happens when you put a piece in the wrong spot? If you put a piece in the wrong spot when you build a bridge, it might mean nothing or it might mean something. It depends on the part and it depends on the spot right so, um, but typically speaking uh, as I said before there's safety factors in bridges so um, the, the safety factor allows people to make small mistakes mm -hmm. in their design or in their construction without being catastrophic as long as the mistake is small right right yeah and I might add to that that a lot of a lot of times when something goes to construction that happens and then we get asked the question what you know is this okay and then we run some numbers right. and say yeah we're okay with that or uh or no we're not and we have to either take that part out or do something build it a little differently somewhere else to make it work that's right so when you build a bridge you have people on site to inspect what you're building and they catch the mistake hopefully right in time that's right uh this is a perfect question following the course is how how did they build the golden gate bridge how did they build the Golden Gate Bridge? Probably a long well, question, <laughs> a long answer. It is a long question, so uh, the long answer, I'll, I'll give you a very short answer. So first they build the foundations to the tower, and then they build the towers, and then they build um, a footbridge to go across for where they're going to lay the cables, and then they lay the cables um, from anchor to anchor. Oh, and by then the anchors have to be built as well. And then once the cable and the anchors and the towers are there, they hang the suspenders from the cables, and then uh, they lift pieces of the deck up um, by segments and connect it to the suspenders, and then they connect those deck pieces together. So that's a very abbreviated version, but it gives you the, the, um, the sequence of events, not just for the Golden Gate, but for any long-span suspension right. bridge. Just two more questions on this. Um, this one's kind of interesting, probably related to maybe your research in, um, in the lab. Is It says, if the weight on a bridge at home, uh, let's see, wait, let me read this here. If, if the weight on a mini model bridge was 110 pounds, how much weight could it hold in real life? <laughs> That's it's hard to answer. <laughs> I don't know. I can answer that question. Maybe yeah, I know. It's, I think it speaks to though, like in, when you're in your lab, you, you obviously make scale models or yes, 
uh, how does that relate to uh, like a, what your work in the lab is versus uh, maybe a, a full size structure? Maybe the comparison that's being made is dead load versus live load hmm. question. So the dead load being essentially the weight of the structure itself and the live load being the load that's imposed on that structure. And typically speaking, the dead load or the weight of the structure itself is larger than um, the load being imposed on it. Hmm. So uh, so the scale model that you make in a lab, it doesn't really scale up to the same proportion in real life. Um, and then the last question here is, what's a good technology job with engineering that you see in the upcoming you know, decades? That's a tough question, a good technology. There's a lot of, as we were mentioning earlier, a lot of innovative ideas out there. I, I can't say which one's going to come out first or be adopted or, or not. It's really hard for me to make that call. Yeah. Um, one, one interesting thing, though, I don't know, this is going to be um, hard to implement, but one really interesting innovation when I asked in the, in the MOOC for the audience to um, show something, a new material or a new way to build a bridge. Someone put up an image of a 3D printer, so a 3D printed bridge, mm -hmm. which I thought was really clever. I didn't know that you could 3D print a bridge. It was obviously a very short span, but I thought that was very clever, the idea of 3D printing a bridge. I think, it, yeah, that's going to be really interesting. I know there's ideas yeah. out there for s printing with steel and, and maybe even concrete. Um, yeah, a, yeah. yeah, yeah, that would take a lot of different disciplines, I think, to come together from mechanical right, right. engineering to computer uh, computer engineering and software engineering. <laughs> a lot of things would have yes, to happen yeah. to make that a viable future technology. Yes. Well, thank you so much, um, Professor Garlock. I, I really appreciate your time. And uh, You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you again. All right, you're welcome. And then I'll post a link to your uh, website. Um, I have it here, too, just for, for people that are interested in your work. Um, it's garlock, G-A-R-L-O-C-K dot Princeton, P-R-I-N-C-E-T-O-N dot E-D-U. And again, thank you for listening to The Art of Engineering and our interview with Professor Maria Garlock. <laughs>